Okay, I'll make a start. I'm sure some people might join us, um, but I'm just conscious of time. So we've got a lot to cover this evening, so we'll get going. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Nicola, and I'm one of the specialist nurses here at Pancreatic Cancer UK. I'm really pleased to be joined today by two consultants in palliative medicine, Dr. James Davis and Dr. Magrid Capel, who will be just discussing palliative care and planning for the end of life. Before we get started, there are a few quick bits of housekeeping to run through. I'll also share some information about the support that we can provide you and your family at Pancreatic Cancer UK. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. You should see a Q&A icon on your screen, which looks like two speech bubbles. To ask a question, just type it into this box. Feel free to ask questions throughout the session. There's no need to wait until the end. Overseas attendees, if you're joining us from outside the UK, you're really welcome. Um, but please keep in mind that the information that we give will be based on the UK healthcare system and we won't be able to advise on options elsewhere, I'm afraid. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website afterwards if you'd like to watch it back or share it with other people who might be interested. Please be aware that any of the questions you ask will be visible to all attendees. You can choose to ask a question anonymously if you'd prefer, and you can upvote questions by clicking on the thumbs up button. This will boost them to the top of the list. There may be questions that are highly specific or fall outside of the scope of today's webinar, so that we can keep the questions we answer relevant to as many people as possible. We may in these cases reply in the Q&A box, offering signposts to support and information or encouraging you to call us on the support line rather than reading all your questions out loud. So I just wanted to talk to you briefly before we begin today about the services that we offer here at the charity for people affected by pancreatic cancer. I'm aware that many of you will already be familiar with perhaps a couple, if not all of these services, but for those of you that aren't, this is a quick introduction for you. Our support line is open to anyone that would like to speak to a specialist nurse regarding pancreatic cancer. We speak to people who are worried about symptoms, who have been diagnosed, family members and to other health professionals that may have a pancreatic specific question. So, for example, we speak to community nurses that have questions around pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, such as Creon. You can see our opening hours displayed there on the screen. On our website, you'll find lots of information that can be downloaded, or you can order paper copies for free. Our publications are available in easy read, large print, video, audio, and braille options. We also host online support sessions on a regular basis, covering a wide variety of relevant topics. You can find all the information you need on our website. It's easy to book on, and if you do need any support in using Zoom to join the sessions, then we can talk that through with you. The sessions are relaxed and informal, as well as being able to ask any questions you may have. It's also a good opportunity to meet others who have been diagnosed or who are supporting someone with a pancreatic cancer diagnosis. And finally, we have our discussion forum. The forum is accessible 24 seven and there's a really supportive community online. You can access the forum via our website. The link is on the screen there and it's a simple process to register. We just ask that you read through our forum guidelines before posting. So as a nurse on the support line, I often hear people ask the question, what exactly is palliative care? Or how do we get more support at home? So we realised that there was a, a need to provide people with some clear information about what this terminology means and what support is out there for you as a person diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, or if you are a family member or a friend supporting someone who's been diagnosed. So what we hope to do this evening is to answer some of those questions that you may have. Now, we know that these conversations can be very difficult. And if you need to take a break at any point during the session, please do. James and Magrid will also give prior notice before they move on to talk more specifically about the end of life. So if you prefer to sit out of this part of the session and come back later for the Q&A, that's absolutely fine. I hope you find the session helpful this evening and I'm going to hand over now to James and Magrid from City Hospice Cardiff. Thank you. Right, we're just going to share our slides now. So, um, welcome. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Margaret Cappell. I'm a palliative medicine consultant. I work in Cardiff and I work in the community. So the patients I see are either outpatients or they're in their own homes. 
And I'm uh, Dr. James Davis. I'm a palliative medicine consultant here at City Hospice also. Um, it's a pleasure to be here for the, we've been asked back, so the first session must have gone okay. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to, to talk to you this evening. So in terms of what we're going to look at um, tonight, I mean, I think uh, Nicola's sort of uh, alluded to a lot of this, but he's thinking about this may be the first introduction that a lot of people have to, to palliative care. And, and I think that it's probably very common for people to be wary of palliative care, to be wary of the word hospice, palliative care, and what that might mean, and maybe keep keep people at arm's length for, for uh, quite some time. So hopefully we're going to give you an overview of actually what do we do, what, what is our remit, and, and what value do we do we add to patients and family members as well, because I'm, I'm conscious that probably a lot of people on the webinar today are actually family members of patients as well. <clears throat> um, Obviously, we, we work in Cardiff, so the, the way that part of care works in the community in Cardiff is going to be slightly different to other places in the country. But there are broad themes that we will go through about who delivers part of care and, and what to expect from, from specialist part of care. Um, as Nicola said, we've got a, a separate se session on, or section, sorry, on um, end of life care, um, which is... I think it's important in that section for us to be honest with the people who want that information. But if now is not the time for, for you to, to engage in that part of the, the webinar, then that's absolutely fine. You can come back or, um, you know, the, the sessions are recorded as well. So that's absolutely fine. But we'll give you a bit of warning before that. So if you want to, you can go and get a cuppa. And then at the end, I think last time was really useful was the question and answer that people had some very uh, interesting and engaging questions. So first of all, let's think about what palliative care is. So the people we see are often continuing to receive anti-cancer treatment. So they might still be having chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So we work alongside the other professionals involved in a patient's care. Our goal is to maximize quality of life. It may be also along the way to achieve some personal goals. And it is about planning for the future when a person's health is less robust and that includes end of life care. So the best way to think about this is to think about, the, think about palliative care holistically. So we think about the whole person. So by that, I mean, let's think about physical care. So by physical care, we are concerned with symptom control. So by that, we want good pain management. We want um, things like gastric stasis, which means that horrible feeling that people sometimes describe bloating or nausea. We want that well controlled. We want to make sure that people's blood sugars are being monitored, that people are comfortable with their bowel habits. For example, if a person's using Creon, are they comfortable about how to manage it? And we want to think about how to live with things like fatigue. When we think about um, psychological and emotional support, we think about the patient and family members. How is everyone coping? Um, how is everyone coping with the information and what the diagnosis means? When we think about spiritual care, the thing to think about is if you're aware you have a life-limiting illness, it often makes a person question the meaning of their life and question any religious or spiritual beliefs they have. And what we want to do is work with that to reach a place of acceptance and comfort where that once again becomes a support for the person and not a source of distress. And that's all in the context of a particular person's culture. So it's about planning ahead and being somewhat um, mobile in what we do, responding to what are the particular problems at the time. So it might be, for example, with social care that the person needs a welfare rights officer to look at finances because the dynamics in the house may have changed as a consequence of the illness. So it's about picking out what's the most important thing at the time and responding to that. And then that ongoing care throughout the person's journey. So in terms of what, well, hopefully what we would add to a person's care who's got pancreatic cancer, and that this extends, we look after people with, with lots of different illnesses, but what are the benefits of, of specialist palliative care? So this is sort of my sales pitch for palliative care that, that actually it, it, adds, it adds value. And, and I, would, I would encourage people to think about engaging with it early 
um, because of some of the things that Margaret has spoken about, you know, that, that we're looking after people, hopefully as a as a whole. And I think the healthcare tries to do that, but that's our that's kind of our bread and butter is trying to see someone as a whole, not just as a as an illness. So in terms of what we can do and you know what the what the research shows is that actually we we aim to provide better symptom control. So as Margaret has said, there's there's lots of symptoms which which can come with pancreatic cancer. And that's our sort of our bread and butter. So it's something that, that you you or your family member probably have, have never faced before and, and don't know what to do. But that's what specialist part of care, that's what we do day in, day out. Um, and through all that and through looking after someone as a whole and holistically, then ultimately what we're aiming to do is improve people's quality of life. Um, here at City Hospice, we've got a, a large uh, sort of counselling uh, team that can help from a psychological point of view. But not everybody needs needs that sort of level of, of input. Sometimes it's just somebody having the, the support and the backup of, of somebody knowing that there's someone to, to call. Um, I think one of the things which becomes evident is, is the it can become confusing and daunting and overwhelming the amount of people that can be involved and the amount of healthcare professionals that can be involved in someone's care um, and part of our job is trying to knit that together and to and to to work with the different people and we'll, we'll go on to talk about what people they the, or what professionals they are but to try and help navigate that and, and to try and help you navigate as well um, if you're under palliative care um, especially if if you're at a point where actually some of the planning for the future feels like something you want to do or can engage in, then actually you're less likely to be admitted to, to hospital. Um, and I think one of the one of the preconceptions I think of part of care is that it's all about end of life care, it's all about the last days of life. Now that is an important part of what we do. Uh, and I think it's important to allow people the opportunity to think about those things. But it, it's not just that. There's there's lots of there's lots of living to do before that, and we try and uh, we try and help facilitate that. Um, I didn't paint this. I can't uh, I, I I can't paint a, a stick man. But this is just really just represent. I, I I imagine probably sometimes what it feels like. You know that 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 you're sort of alone in a in a in a stormy sea. So it's a it's a bit of a, a bit glib, but trying to calm that sea down and just make it a little easier to navigate through something which you would never have been through or, or you know, your family member has never been through before. So I think we've touched upon this, but, but I think it, it's very common for people to be anxious. You know, we, we often, we're, we're meeting people for the first time tomorrow, and I will go out with one of the one of the nurses or they'll come into clinic and it's the first time they've met us. And, and I can have a clinic full of, of new patients and every single one of them says, I was worried about coming to see palliative care um, and, and sort of hospice. But I think the, the vast majority of people, when, when we've seen them actually have a positive experience and, and you know, they, the, probably their preconception of what it was is, is not the reality of it in a positive way. Um, I think one of the other things that that we that we come across is, is if patients are uh, have been under onco oncology teams and having sort of active treatment like chemotherapies, radiotherapy, or they may have had surgery at the start of their their sort of journey, and then they're discharged, and there can be a feeling of almost abandonment because there's been so much input and so many outpatient appointments and blood tests and so much uh, contact. It's then where where do you go? Um, so, but I think it's important to know that actually not having treatment directed specifically at the cancer, so things like chemotherapy, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean you shouldn't be getting care. And, and I think it's important to know that. Um, and this is sort of this is a bit of an oversimplification, but it's thinking about actually the there's a transition. It's not sort of all or nothing. You know, some patients I see are worried that actually, but if they're seeing me first before seeing their oncologist because they've got symptoms which we can help with. That means they don't see their oncologist. That, that isn't the case, you know, that we're here to, to help support people alongside other treatments they may be having. And then when the point comes that actually either themselves or the oncologist or usually between them feel that treatment is, is no longer the right thing, then we carry on caring for people.
So if we think about who might deliver palliative care. So palliative care um, can actually be delivered by any professional who provides care to a patient. Um, generalists tend to be people like general practitioners, district nurses who might be involved in your care, whereas specialists tend to be um, professionals such as ourselves who have expertise, degrees and experience, and we work with people who have life-limiting illness all the time. Um, so specialist palliative care teams, the way palliative care has grown up in the UK, um, it's grown up in the hospice movement. Um, so it is the two words are often synonymous. Um, so please don't be scared if actually your local palliative care team actually comes from a hospice. They are the same thing. It just happens to be that's the, who provides the palliative care in the area that you live. Um, again, as James mentioned earlier, there are lots of professionals. We work in teams. We work with occupational therapists and um, nurses, welfare rights officers, social workers. So when people are coming into your home, it's really important that you ask both who they are, what their role is and how they will link in with the others. OK. It doesn't mean that any of the other professionals, when you're seeing palliative care, shouldn't still be involved in the patient's care. So, for example, the surgeons are often involved early on. For example, they may have a role in diagnosis. They may have a role in managing any obstructive symptoms, even if surgery isn't planned. And sometimes they have a role in stenting. And later on in a person's illness, they may still have a role. If there is a problem with a stent, we may go back to them and ask them to revisit that that problem. Oncologists both initiate and oversee chemotherapy and radiotherapy. They monitor both the effects of the treatment they're delivering and they monitor how the disease is responding to the treatment that's being given. They do that by both clinically, so how the patient is, they look at scans and they look at blood tests um, to determine how effective the treatment is. We don't replace general practitioners so your general practitioner who, is, who oversees medical care in the community is still there. They will look at any new issues that arise in normal working hours or indeed out of working hours. It would be they who the out of hours GP would, the per, would be the person to contact. In terms of getting repeat prescriptions that have either been initiated in hospital or by the surgical or oncology teams or by ourselves, it would be the GP who initiates sorry, who repeats those prescriptions that you need. The district nurses are really important. So they are the nursing team that come out to see a person at home. They, they are available 24 hours a day, but there are often limited staff in the out of hours period. So by out of hours period, I mean at night and over the weekend. They have a role in monitoring the person and they also have a role in administering medication for example, or in particular, injectable medication I'm talking about here. They are also the first point of call for organising care, particularly if it's nursing care we're talking about, which is relevant when a person's health deteriorates. Okay. So as we said, specialist palliative care such as ourselves, they're often charities. Sometimes they're a national charity. Sometimes they're local to the area that you live in. Um, teams work slightly differently, but there should be palliative care available to a patient, both at home, such as ourselves. If the patient is an inpatient in hospital, there are teams that can visit while the patient is in hospital. And likewise, um, when the person is in, for example, in a care home, if that's the case, there is a team that can go into the care home. So wherever the patient needs to be seen, there should be a palliative care team available to review them. And that includes oncology centres as well. Um, worth thinking about hospices, inpatient hospices at this point. So people tend to think about them only in the context of end of life care. And you're right, actually, hospices do provide end of life care for some, but actually their care is more than this. Their care is there for symptom control. So for example, if a person at home is struggling for whatever reason with symptom control, Sometimes a period in the inpatient hospice is appropriate to get on top of those symptoms to settle down again and then come home. And we put a bit of information if you want to find who your local palliative care service is at the bottom of the slide, the address there should help you find them. 
So this is just a slide with a large number of different sorts of hospices and palliative care services that we've found around the UK to give you an idea of how many are out there. But as I say, if you go to that website, you should find who's appropriate for your, for your area. The best is in the middle. <laughs> I'm allowed to say that. Right, so thinking about what to expect from, from specialist palliative care. So we've spoken about what what the role of palliative care is and what the you know what the the um how it works but actually when somebody comes to see you what what, what can you expect from them i, I think I, we need to talk very generally here because there are different um different sort of uh, uh charities around the country and, and it works differently but but broadly these are the things that you should be able to expect from from your palliative care team Sorry, James, sorry to interrupt you. Your mic is slightly dipping out. I'm not sure whether there's something in front of it or whether it's brushing against something. It's not too bad, but I just wanted to flag in case okay. that was obvious. Is that any better? That sounds good to me, yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll lean in. Apologies, you're going to have to see my head in, a, in bigger. But um, <laughs> yeah, Thanks so uh, let, me, let me know if, if, if it goes again. Apologies for that. So yeah, thinking about uh, sort of the, some of the things we've spoken about already, but actually the, the overall goal should be helping you from a, in a holistic way. So the, the physical symptom control, people often think that the pain is the only thing that we look at. But no, as Margaret has said, there's lots of things that, that uh, palliative care can, can help with. Looking at the, the social, the spiritual, the psychological, the advanced care planning, all the things that we've spoken about is something that you should, you know, you should... Uh, be able to access from your from your palliative care team. I think it's important that actually communication is honest and open. And by that, I don't I don't mean that people force information on you, or that or that you you have conversations that you really don't want to have. Difficult conversations about planning for the future. But I think it's important that if you want information, that that is provided honestly and openly in a, in a kind sort of empathetic way but that you know I, I think if, if a patient or family member asks me a question I think I, I I deserve to give them the respect of giving them an honest answer even if it's a difficult answer to hear um, I think the other thing that hopefully we we do at City Hospice and should be done around the country by palliative care teams is actually to try and to try and work together so it, it's about trying to to build plans together about how we tackle a certain uh, difficulty that someone's having or how we we think about planning for the future and and as we've alluded to a uh, a lot of our job is is not just in the person's home it's actually the all the things that go on behind the scenes trying to link things together and and the complex sort of web sometimes that healthcare can be to try and to try and help with that um i think when we first meet someone we have a doctor and a nurse on the first visit not everywhere will will do it like that um but the first visit is usually the 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 most daunting and with the most questions I usually say to patients and families it's it's like the Spanish Inquisition that there's lots of information but it's there the reason we do that is because we want this in we want to want to really get to know that person quickly and also to get to know what is actually troubling that person so we can try and help so it's not just that we're being nosy it's for it's for a good reason um, and then you should be given contact details for the team so actually we would be in touch um, uh, periodically, but actually if there's a problem, we do rely on patients and family members letting us know. So it's better to know sooner so we can try and address something than, than, than leave it go. So we, you should have contact details for both in and out of hours so that you've got support 24 hours a day. Um, yeah, so I think uh, what I say is, is if in doubt, pick up the phone. Sometimes you don't know who to call you're better off calling somebody who can then maybe sign post you, post you in the right direction than calling nobody. Um, and often, so, or sometimes that's what we do actually, somebody has an acute problem or something that actually requires a GP to examine them or an out of hours GP to examine them, then they're the best people placed to do that, but we can help facilitate that. And then depending on that individual, where they are in their illness and what their wishes are, will determine what happens at that point but if in doubt pick up the phone and as i said before that it, you know if you're not sure about this and it's worth just speaking to your local palliative care team just to see what what they can offer and and you know what services they have 
So as I've spoken about from city hospice's point of view, that is this is specific to us, but should be a broad idea of what happens. We get referrals from lots of, uh, of, of different places. Not, unsurprisingly, the most common is from GPs, given that we work in the community. So GPs will refer in patients with lots of different types of illnesses, but uh, patients with pancreatic cancer. Uh, we may get them directly from oncology teams or surgical teams. And I mean, the, what we would advocate is earlier the better, so we can get to know you, you can get to know us, and, and we can you know, help support from an early stage. Um, but you know, for some people, actually, it, it might not be the right time. So it's at lots of different stages at, uh, of someone's illness. As I've said, usually with us, it's, it's a uh, review with a doctor and a nurse. And we're looking at the things that we've spoken about, the, the symptoms, the psychological, the social, all that holistic care. But also I think importantly as well, back to the, to the open and honest communication is actually thinking about, well, what does a person understand about their illness and what do they expect to happen in the future? Because I think if we're gonna plan for the future, then it's important for everybody almost to be on the same page, to be of the same understanding of, of where we are now, and what we expect to happen. Um, as I say, everybody's got their own information needs. So it's not that we're gonna come in and, and, uh, and just throw information at, at patients and families that they, that they don't want to have. But it's trying to, we try to work that out when, when we first meet someone. Uh, but it's also an opportunity, you know, we ask lots of questions. It's an opportunity for people to ask us questions as well. And, you know, often there are lot, probably lots of things that, you know, people think, oh, maybe a stupid question. Well, there's no such thing as a stupid question. You're better off asking. Uh, and, you know, it may be a very simple answer, which will put your mind at ease. Um, and as I say, then at the start, at end of a first assessment, we'll have a plan. What do we need to do now? And how are we going to, to look at sort of following things up in the future to support? Uh, so in terms of um, sort of our... Uh, addressing issues. So, so if we're picking up um, any issues in terms of symptom control, um, as Margaret has said, uh, we, we get our prescriptions through the GP. I think it's important because the GPs are very involved in people's care in the community, that we don't just take people over, that it's all sort of mutual working and, and, and trying to work together to to, uh, to get the best outcome for somebody. Um, so we will ask the GP for uh, lots of different medicines for symptom control. I won't go into them in detail because that's, a, a, that's a, a whole day's talk on its own, I think. Um, but just to mention that often when I, if I mention morphine to patients, often they, there's concerns, um, either the connotations with sort of end of life care or things like addiction, but actually it's, a, it's something that we do use at, at the end of life but we use it for, for patients at lots of different stages of their illness. And, and just because somebody's talking about that, either for pain or breathlessness, doesn't, doesn't equate to end of life care. And it certainly won't shorten someone's life if we, you know, if we use it appropriately as we do. So it's, it's to not be afraid of that because you may find that actually if you've got pain and, and people use these stronger painkillers, actually if it works well, it's gonna enhance your quality of life. Um, as you've spoken about sort of from, a, from an emotional point of view, there's, we've got counselling here. Uh, we've also got complementary therapy, reflexology, and, and different places around the country will have different things. But that can be, you know, a, a way of, of people relaxing and, and, and trying to almost to get away sometimes from the, some of the, the, the difficulties that, that they have. Um, we've got an occupational therapist uh, who will look at environmental support. So by that, I mean, if people are starting to struggle with the stairs or, or struggling to get in and out of bed or, in, or up and down from a chair, which, which can happen as somebody's illness uh, progresses and their, and their health deteriorates, these things are not to be underestimated. You know, they're as important as any medicine we prescribe. Um, we've got a social worker who can uh, sort of instigate or put in place care for patients. Um, as Margaret has alluded to, we've got a welfare rights officer who can look at things like benefits because it's, you know, the forms can be mind boggling, but actually it's, it's, their, it's their bread and butter and, and they can navigate that very easily. And things like a blue car badge just to make day to day living easier and also to, to keep people doing things uh, that they enjoy for as long as possible. Um, 
and then thinking about the other the other role we have and we touched upon it a few times but is advanced care planning so difficult discussions but thinking about the future with people um with our team and probably with most teams around the country that the follow-up will usually be with a clinical nurse specialist or, or a member of the nursing team um and really the frequency people ask how often well it depends on it depends on how someone's condition is if their condition is stable their symptoms are well controlled you know it may be it may be sort of monthly whereas if things are changing quickly or there's uncontrolled symptoms it may be daily so it's very much geared towards need and and as, as i've said before we also rely on people phoning in so so raise the alarm if there's an issue because usually there's someone who can help um so just back to what we were talking about in terms of communication, I think this is really important to, to expect honest communication between from healthcare professionals with yourself. But also, I think it's important, it's hard, but it's important to, to think about the communication that uh, if you as a patient or you as a family member, a loved one, um, often people are trying to, I've got the same worries and they've got the same thoughts and they've got the same questions, but they don't voice them because they're worried that they're going to hurt that, that hurt their loved one. I think from experience, actually, the opposite is probably true. Getting that out actually makes things, uh, getting it out in the open and talking about it usually allays people's fears. And, and the fear of the unknown is usually worse than the, than the actual reality. Um, Thinking about children as well, I think this can be particularly difficult. And I think something that came up on the last webinar that we've tried to expand on just a little bit. Um, there are resources out there. That's just one resource that we've we've sort of highlighted there. But I, I think uh, I spoke to our, or we spoke to our um, head of counselling about this. And, I, and just the main themes that came out in terms of communicating with children, I think, first of all, is it needs to be age appropriate so obviously the younger the child especially sort of under five are probably not going to have a a real concept of what illness and, and what death is as well you know that, that that's quite abstract um but as a child gets older and their development progresses actually they will process things more as we would the important thing about that i think is to is to is to check the understanding you know of of the child so mm. to do that in a way that is non-threatening to them but to ask questions like oh, do you think you know whoever it is do you think the dad is unwell um and how how do you think we can help the other important thing is to not tell untruths i, I haven't called it lies because actually they're always done out of out of love and out of care but actually being honest i think is important and just checking in and this is an ongoing process with with children to try and address their concerns and it may be at the most random time that they come and ask a question about it but it's just to make that time to talk and to to try and to try and almost put your, yourself in their in their uh, in their head which is easier said than done i've got an eight and ten year old myself and sometimes they're their head might be a scary place but it's just to try and to try and think about actually what are they what are they asking me so hopefully that's been helpful, but there's more information out there. And, you know, there's, there's a link there as well that might be helpful. So what should you ask your palliative care team? Um, I think that is, that is really individual. I think that everybody, uh, ev what people want to know is, is very unique. Um, so but I think if you're, if you're due to meet your part, your part of care team, I think it's important. The same goes for your oncology team or whoever it may be. I think it's, it's important just to think about what do you want to know? Um, and I usually advise people to write it down because I don't know what you think, Margaret, but usually if you ask someone, if you've got a question, if people do it to me, uh, the questions fall out of my head and then you leave and you think, oh, I wish I'd asked that. So actually writing them down and, you know, keep, I sometimes say to patients, we'll keep a, keep a pen and pad somewhere so you can just write it down as you think about it. And then we can go through it, you know, to talk honestly about it and to answer those questions honestly. Um, difficult questions are difficult, but I think they, if there's something which is recurrently coming to you and, and you're worried about asking it, it's probably finding the right person and the right time to ask that question because otherwise it's going to it's going to have a psychological impact on you. Um, and the other thing sometimes we found is is that people's information needs are unique, and patients' information needs, but also family members' information needs and loved ones are unique. 
And so it may be that actually a patient wants to know absolutely everything and a family member isn't quite there or often vice versa. And I think that we find it helpful that if family members and loved ones have got, a, have got questions they want to ask, but a patient doesn't want to know some of maybe the detail, then that's okay. But it, it's really beneficial to be able to have that conversation maybe in private with the person who wants to know. Um, and that can be can be really can be helpful. And I think it's something just to think about if, if some people are struggling with with maybe different information needs within a family or within, you know, within a social network. So thinking about advanced care planning, um, this is to, we touched upon this a few times, but it, it's planning for a deterioration in someone's health. And, and it does involve thinking about difficult things. Um, often we'll, you know, the, the sort of old adage is, is to hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Um, from experience and, and you know, from, from all the literature that, that, that's out there, I think it, it's better to try and do this early when somebody's actually well enough to think about these these uh, difficult issues and to think about um, some of the the complex things and if somebody's unwell then they may be in a position where they can't think about those things or actually they're very fatigued or or they they're just not in a place where they're able to do it so I think trying to do it early although hard is, if, if possible is, is makes it much easier when some of these plans need to be put in place um, and yeah if we don't know what someone's wishes are then then it's 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 hard to to honor them so so it's almost giving giving someone a, a voice often people worry that with if you talk about issues around end of life care and advanced care planning that that means that it's going to shorten someone's life um, but actually people can remain very positive and want the active treatment and seek out the active treatment from oncology, but still talk about some of those difficult issues. Uh, as I say, it's voluntary, so it, it, we would never force it on somebody, but I think it's important to, to realise why it's important to think about it and why we have healthcare professionals try to talk about some of these difficult issues, because it, ultimately it's for that person and their loved one's benefits. Um, as I've alluded to before, I think ha having a good understanding about where we are and where where things potentially will go with someone's health is really important because if I'm thinking that actually this person's health is deteriorating quite quickly, but that person thinks I'm absolutely fine and 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 uh, you know that that I, I'm I'm going to live until I'm a hundred, you know, those things, I can see then why that person would think, well, why are you talking about these difficult things? So that's almost the first step is that understanding. And sometimes that's what all we do is, is we don't talk about some of the difficult things straight away. We just actually express what potentially may happen in the future. Some of the more concrete things that we do ask people, and as I say, these are difficult things to think about, but it is what someone wants. Essentially, we're planning for a, a time where someone's health is less robust, actually, if they were unwell with something that could be reversible, like an infection, um, would they want to go to hospital? Some people say no, under no circumstances, and that's okay. Um, but then that does mean that we need to plan for that. Um, thinking about actually, when we are approaching the end of life, actually, where would somebody want to be cared for? Um, broadly, the options would be at home or if that person's home is actually a care home in that setting. Um, for other people, it may be a hospice, an inpatient hospice where there's a bed where, where people are going to be cared for. For other people, actually, it may be hospital. They may say, no, I want everything done for as much as possible. The other thing, and again, this is a difficult one to think about, but is about resuscitation. Um, and often... At some point during someone's illness, usually this is this is discussed and it's very specific that if someone's heart were to stop or they were to stop breathing, what should we do? What's the appropriate thing or what would that person want us to do? Would they want us to try and intervene? Um, the reason I think it's important to try and discuss that early is then if somebody say unwell and admitted to hospital and they, then they're first having that conversation there, it's a, it's a scary environment anyway probably not the time to first share that. So it's just thinking about those issues beforehand. 
Um, and there's also the, the practical planning. So actually things like wills, pension, funeral. And these are things that, that if people need help with, that there's support out there to be able to do. So these are just a couple of folks that, that we would use the, the, on the, the, my left hand side. So the blue one is an advanced care planning document that people can document their wishes for the future. Uh, the right is an old version of something called a do not resuscitate form. Different places in the country where well, there's the respect form that's used, different ways of documenting. But it's important that if you've got certain specific wishes about the future, to communicate them with your loved ones, but also to communicate them with healthcare professionals so we know what you want and, and you've got your voice. Um, so yeah, so that, that's sort of covering what we, um, you know, what, what we've spoken about. Uh, and communication is key because if I've, if we've spoken to someone about advanced care planning on their own, just a verbal conversation, and they're unwell and they can't tell someone what they want, it's almost like there was no point in me ever having that conversation. So talking talking between healthcare professionals, but talking as families and loved ones, I think is, is equally, if not more, important. Other things which you may come across are things like a lasting power of attorney where you can um, nominate what would be called an attorney. It doesn't have to be your nearest family, nearest relative, uh, but someone who would make these decisions for you uh, when you lose capacity, if it's for, if the attorney is for health and welfare. Um, I think it's, it's probably even more important then for them to know your wishes so that they can try and honor it, um, honor it in the future. Um, and as I've spoken about before that some people don't want to consider this and some people never want to consider these issues that over time usually people do um, come to consider some of these difficult things but if a person really doesn't want to talk about it in terms of a patient then usually we need someone else to to be able to have some of these conversations with to try and make some of these decisions and so maybe sometimes that's a that's a reasonable approach to to have and ultimately what we want to do is to is to do the best for that person. So the next section is actually is on end of life care. And so is a little bit more detail on end of life care, which for some people on the call, I think may, uh, some people may be, may be interested to, to hear about that, others maybe not, not so much. So if you, and the people who didn't want to, if you wanted to, to sort of go and get a, a cuppa or something now, it would probably take about, about 10, uh, 10, 15 minutes um, just to go through um, and then after that then we'll we'll just sort of sum up and do a, do a q a hi james we we're just getting a little bit of sound issues again um Ooh, i wonder if you can tilt it slight i think it's slightly better when margaret is speaking so i'm not sure about the microphone placement we may have to persevere but um if there's anything that anyone's missed please do feel free to ask things in the q a and we'll be happy to go over them in the section oh, apologies the um I think it's it's mostly fine, but just dipping out on occasion. Thanks. So if we think about end of life care, one of the questions that people often ask is how long have I got? And the truth is actually this is an individual thing. You often hear people being given averages but I've yet to meet an average patient or an average person in all the years of practice. So sometimes the best thing to do is to think about the physical independence and the, if you like, the wellness of that person and to place it in some kind of context. Now, this is a, a slide that's often used in healthcare to think about the differences in illness trajectories so the journeys that people experience over time. And you'll notice that in the context of cancer, people's health is relatively well maintained for a long period of time. And then there's that dip we see in the graph and that corresponds to a person being less independent. So by that, I mean, actually they're not necessarily going out of the house. They're not necessarily going to meet perhaps children or grandchildren from school. They don't feel physically up to it. They're perhaps just staying at home. They may go from bed to chair. They're not necessarily partaking in chores in the house. They may struggle at some point when we're further down that slope to do things like get dressed independently, to become to wash independently. 
and indeed they may spend more time in bed and indeed more time asleep. Now that pie chart in the middle represents deaths in an average GP practice. So actually the um, brown one, the cancer one, actually for an average GP practice, or they will see less deaths from cancer over the course of a year than they will from those other illnesses that are mentioned on that slide. And that's why as specialists, we work with the generalists to try and support an individual patient to make sure they've got the best care. So giving an exact prognosis is impossible and any time frames you've been given should be considered a guide only. As a rough rule of thumb, think about the deterioration. So think about that slope on the graph. If you see the person you know health changing and independence changing by month by month, then the likely prognosis is going to be months going forward. If, however, something sudden happens and you see actually their health is changing on a day by day basis, then actually that prognosis is probably days. Always, if you see something sudden happen and that rate of change on that graph changes and there's an accelerated change, to me and to us, that means that actually we should trigger, actually, what's going on here? Is there something reversible in the person's health? So, for example, if um, thinking about the context of pancreatic cancer, if a person has a stent because in the past they've had a block bile duct and they've been jaundiced and very yellow, we think about actually has something changed here? Has that stent become blocked again? Is there an infection that needs treating and the person wants that treated? So if there's a change, think about the cause of the change. And also if we haven't already done it, then we think about advanced care planning. Make sure we, we, that we should plan ahead for if the health continues to deteriorate, how are we going to manage that? How are we going to achieve that person's wishes? So what do we see with somebody deteriorating? As we've said, when we're approaching end of life, we expect worsening independence. When we're in perhaps our last days, we might see them eating and drinking less and they won't be hungry. We see them sleeping for more prolonged periods and there may be moments with more confusion. And sometimes we see leg swelling. So what we call in medical terms, peripheral edema, but in practical terms, you might, might notice um, the person's leg swelling more. Um, usually when we're in those last days to weeks, we're perhaps in bed pretty much all the time. And in that case, back to what we mentioned earlier in the talk, we should think about how do we man manage that person's care in bed? So that's when we trigger the district nursing referral if they're not already involved, thinking about providing practical hands-on care and nursing in bed to maintain that person's dignity. It's often a good point at this point to think about the medications a person's taking and actually to make sure that we're using the medications that help with symptom control and actually not to practice, have lots of medicines going and the person being asked to swallow all sorts of things. So we rationalize and stop any medicines that a person doesn't need. So as we say, at this point, if the health's deteriorating, we want to review by a medical professional. It could be the GP, it could be somebody from specialist palliative care. We're looking for something that's reversible. And if we don't find it, so if we don't find an explanation that we can fix for that change in a person's health, then we need to think about, okay, it looks like we're approaching those last days. Where are we going to think about caring for the person? Is that going to be at home or is it going to be at an inpatient hospice, for example? Because if it is an inpatient hospice, then we should, as a community team, for example, support the transfer of care into that inpatient hospice. But if the person's going to stay at home, we need to plan to make sure that the person has everything they need available to have a dignified care. So. Part of that means we need everyone at home to be on board to understand what we're talking about and that time is now shorter than those initial conversations. So that means family members, 
That mean, may mean bringing children up to speed if they're at home as well. We may need to go through the plan. So if the plan is for the person to stay at home and to die at home, then we need to, everybody to understand that and what to do in specific circumstances. As healthcare professionals, we organize what are called just-in-case medication. Um, that's administered by the district nurses, but it does require you as family members to contact the district nurses to administer it. If so, when would you contact them? So just-in-case medication um, covers the symptoms that may occur, and I emphasize may, when a person dies. So though that might be pain, that might be sickness, that might be noisy breathing, and that might be restlessness or agitation. So what we do if a person is at home is arrange for those medications to be in a box in a person's home. So that actually if you as a family member spot that in your loved one, you ring the district nurses who come out, they assess the patient to see what the problem is, and if they feel it's appropriate, they would then administer that medicine under the skin. Okay. If we find that a person is, had, has had more than two or perhaps three injections over the course of 24 hours, what we're thinking here is actually the medication that's been administered under the skin hasn't lasted. And therefore we would think about a syringe driver being used. A syringe driver is just a, a continuous, it's a, it's a medical device, it runs on a battery, it's administered by the district nurses, and it just delivers the medicine that we feel is appropriate for the patient to get good symptom control. It delivers it over 24 hours under the skin. So in the community, we often use the under the skin route because obviously a person has a, a lot of skin. Um, it isn't the case that as you may have ever, you may have found out in hospital, you have cannulas which are placed in veins and they come out and often cause distress. So to avoid that problem occurring in the community, we tend to use the under the skin route. Okay, you may notice that we use syringe drivers in a person's care when it's not in an end of life situation. And again, that's absolutely right. So just because you have a syringe driver doesn't mean that a person's dying. We sometimes use them to control pain or sickness much earlier in a person's illness. Again, just because it ensures that the medicine is being absorbed when a person is being sick um, and they therefore can't swallow tablet or liquid medicine. I would expect any palliative care team to review the person on a regular basis, both to monitor symptoms and as family members listening tonight, please contact palliative care teams to let them know that there's been a change in the health if there hasn't already been involved. District nurses or occupational therapists may um, bring some more equipment into the home, and that's essentially to help with the independence of the person, even at this point. And that might be a hospital bed so that the person can sit up unaided if they need to. It might be a commode which is placed next to the bed so that the person can transfer out of the bed onto the commode to use the facilities, or it may be a bottle to use in bed, or indeed incontinence pads, all aimed at maintaining dignity here. Um, and as I say, hands-on care is usually organised by the district nurses. And if it hasn't already been discussed and thought about, then the concept of resuscitation and ensuring a form is in place is sometimes a sensible thing to think about at this point. And then what we're saying is actually when that person dies, what we want is comfortable, symptom controlled care with the right people around them that matter to them in the place that they wish to be. And when their heart stops, what we're saying is we're not going to press on their chest and try and restart the heart because in this instance, we're not expecting that to work, to be effective. And after death, we would expect to ring the out of hours GP if it's at night or the in hours GP if it's in the day to let them know that the person has passed away. So in those last hours, we would expect the person often to be very sleepy, perhaps slipping in and out of consciousness. They may well be aware as we often are, if you 
think about those grey hours in the morning before you wake up. You're often aware what's going on in the bedroom, aren't you, before you wake up. Think about the same principle here. Although the person is there and they may be very sleepy or unconscious, they may well be aware of noise in the room and the comfortable things. So talk to them exactly as you always would. If the symptoms are well managed, that's excellent. That's what we're aiming for. If they're not, please ring your specialist palliative care team or the district nurses or the GPs. Let them know, do something about it. Feel empowered to do so. You may notice in those last couple of hours that breathing can become quite noisy. The patient isn't usually aware of that, but as family members in the room, you might be. And essentially what it is, it's the saliva that we all generate in our mouth. We're not swallowing it properly in that circumstance, and it often pools in the back of the throat. And as air passes over it, it can be quite noisy. We can resolve it with medicine, but actually sometimes just turning the person in the bed also makes them take a swallow, gets rid of that saliva, and it settles down. But particularly if they're children at home um, or somebody's concerned or frightened, really important to go through what it is and what it's not. It's not the patient being distressed. See, people often ask and worry about eating and drinking. Um, your appetite and thirst diminishes very often as we get to these last hours. Really important as family members to think about mouth care, and that is something you can do. Um, and as I say, different areas have access to different things. But essentially, sometimes a baby toothbrush, dipping it in water and um, lip salve or Vaseline on the lips and cleaning the inside of the mouth on a regular basis can be moist and can be comforting when a person doesn't feel like or isn't able to take a, a proper drink, so to speak. And if you have any questions, you know, we only get to travel this journey once. So it's really important that you ask them of the professionals. Don't feel embarrassed or, as James said earlier, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Do ask um, so that we can make a difference or be reassured if something doesn't need to be done, that actually everything is unfolding as it should. Right. So um, I think we've I, oh, I'll, I'll come in a little bit, uh, a little bit closer. Apologies for the um, for the sound issues. Um, it's uh, typical that things were, were, were working fine before and usually I'm loud enough for them to come through. So, um, so yeah, so uh, we sort of come to the end of, of the, the presentation part of it. Um, hopefully it's been, you know, it's been useful. Um, I think in terms of what we, the main sort of take home messages, hopefully, is to not be afraid of palliative care, is to not see it as a negative thing or that, uh, that it is necessarily means that things are significantly deteriorating, but to see it hopefully as a positive thing and something to help, help uh, a patient and help a family to live as good a quality of life as they can within, within the, the limitations that the illness can put on people. Just thinking about some of the difficult things that we've spoken about, um, and I think it's important to to sort of recognize, yes, they are difficult things, but planning early and, and that hoping for the best, planning for the worst, usually helps us avoid a crisis and, and also means that if people have got significant or um, uh, very sort of uh, um, significant wishes about their future care, that we know about them so that we can try and try and honor someone's wishes. Um, there is lots of support available. I think sometimes it can feel overwhelming and sometimes it can probably feel like there is none, but there is support available. So I would I would sort of urge you that if you're not sure is just to find out who your local part of care team is. And, and maybe even if it's just a phone call, just to just to inquire as to what they what they can offer that then that might be something which is beneficial for you or your loved one. And also hopefully to give you a, a bit of comfort that there is someone out there. And, and as we said a few times, if you're worried, just pick up the phone and, and just to speak to somebody. Um, I think some of the what we've spoken about in the presentation today, uh, today certainly some of the things about end of life care. Um, it may be that it might not be so relevant today or it may be something that you didn't want to consider in depth today. But it might be something that in the future that hopefully is is, is useful to you. Um, so yes, so thank you for uh, for having us today and for for allowing us to to talk to you. It's a 
it's a privilege as always. Um, and uh, I think hopefully we'll, we'll be able to have some interesting questions to, for us to answer. Hopefully not too difficult. We've got some great questions coming through for you both. Um, and we will get to the Q&A in a moment. Um, thank you for that session. That was fantastic and really informative. I'm sure it was helpful for a lot of people here today. Um, so we're just going to share the screen again because I just wanted to touch on a couple of things before we move to the Q&A. So I wanted to signpost to some other organisations that offer both emotional and practical support. So we've got Macmillan, which I think most people will be familiar with, and also Maggie's. Um, they both offer a range of services, including dedicated cancer benefit advisors that can help you to apply for benefits and also Macmillan grants. They can also advise you on matters such as applying for a blue badge, concessionary parking, and they can signpost you to local support also in the area. I'm aware that there are people here this evening that are caring for a loved one. And so I just wanted to mention as well, Carers UK, which is a charity dedicated to recognising and supporting the needs of carers across the country. In terms of financial planning, here at Pancreatic Cancer UK, we're partnered with two organisations, Fairwill and the National Free Wills Network, who both offer people ability to write a will for free. You can write a will online with Fairwill or speak to a solicitor in person through the National Free Wills Network, and there will be no cost to you and no obligation to leave a gift in your will. Due to different legislation in Scotland and Northern Ireland, however, the online service is only available to people living in England or Wales, I'm afraid. But wherever you are in the UK, you can make use of the free in-person service. OK, so um, I just wanted to mention as well, as we move on to the Q&A, if anyone's joining by phone today, um, the Q&A box won't necessarily work. So you would need to raise your hand by pressing asterisk nine on your phone. Um, at this point, you'd be prompted to unmute yourself and speak. Um, but for people joining online, please continue just to use the Q&A box. OK, so we'll make a start with some of these questions. Um, first of all, Margaret and James. Uh, oh, this is a good question. So should I seek out my palliative care team at a relatively early stage? Is the holistic needs assessment that's offered by Macmillan the same thing? I think I'd, I'll tackle the first question. <laughs> um, I would say yes. I mean, I think the I don't think. There's no harm in, in speaking to your palliative care team um, uh, early on. And I think there's potentially uh, a lot of benefit. You know, there, there are a proportion of patients that we may see for a proportion of, uh, for a period of time. There are some symptom control issues or, or financial or um, social issues that we can help with. Uh, and then if their disease is stable, um, for a significant period of time and all the the holistic things that we've spoken about are, are um, well managed then sometimes we we may discharge people for a period knowing that there will come a point where if the disease progresses then we will see them in the future so I there's, there's no harm in doing that uh, in in having a chat with your local palliative care team okay great thanks James okay so the next question um, I would just, just before I read this out, I would mention as well, it's probably worth you giving us a call on the support line so we can talk about this um, in a bit more specific detail, but I'll just cover this briefly. So my husband has had two years since diagnosis. In early May, he suddenly got very ill with breathing difficulties and ended up in hospital for 11 days with pneumonia. It took four days to get any medical help. 111 was useless. One week home and then ill with inability to eat and vomiting and another 10 days in hospital, home with bed sores. Now much better, but very sick again last night, both getting scared at the thought of repeat hospital admissions via a and &E, and I am physically exhausted. Will I recognise end of life? That's a good question. It is. I mean, firstly, it, it sounds like you've had an incredibly difficult experience, both of you, and I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, I would like to hope that your palliative care team are involved with your husband's care now. Um, and if not, I think it's something that you should perhaps ask your GP for that referral to explain all the background, because it sounds like listening to what you're describing, there's a number of issues to be addressed here. There's both his symptom management in terms of stopping him being sick and understanding why he's being sick. 
And then secondly, there's some planning in the future, isn't it? What can be done here and now so that we don't have to go through that loop again of taking him back into hospital unless there's something going on that would ben that he would benefit from by admission, by that admission. So a bit of work to actually understand, control those symptoms and plan ahead, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Margaret. Okay, next question. Um, is the key worker the oncology consultant? It kind of depends where the person is in their journey. So if, you're, if the person you're talking about is having chemotherapy and radiotherapy, there's usually an oncology clinical nurse specialist who tends to take the key worker role, certainly in the oncology centres that we tend to work with, um, and provide that link. And they are often the ones who link to the oncology consultant and also link with community palliative care teams and the GPs to update everyone regarding what's happening. Now, perhaps if the person is earlier in their journey, perhaps at the point of diagnosis, um, and you're seeing the surgeons only at this point and you haven't met the oncology teams, that key worker at that point might be the surgical clinical nurse specialist, the pancreatic cancer nurse specialist, depending where you are, and they might be the ones who are coordinating the appointments, your review with the surgeons, perhaps your review with the dietitians, and all those things, so that your key worker may change along the journey. Mm -hmm. Perhaps when you're not having chemotherapy or radiotherapy anymore, it might actually be the palliative care clinical nurse specialist at that point. I think it's probably worth just asking, isn't it? If, if you're going to an appointment and saying, actually, who, who do I turn to? I mean, we do give out kind of a, a, a crib sheet, don't we, with, with, because we, we recognise that sometimes it's hard to know who to turn to. Um, when we first meet someone, we uh, sort of I call it a bit of a cheat sheet that you've got who to contact for what. Um, but it might be worth just asking at your next appointment or the next healthcare professional that you routinely are, are engaging with is just to say, look, who, who's kind of almost in charge here and they should be able to give you more specifics there. Um, but yeah, it, I, I, would, I would ask them who, who's sort of taking that role at the moment. But as Margaret said, that may change over time. Um, it's worth, worth asking again in the future then if you're not sure. Mm -hmm. Thanks, James. Okay, next question. Um, is jaundice considered an end of life sign? No, not necessarily um, is the quickest answer to that. Um, jaundice may occur for a number of reasons. So in pancreatic cancer, there may be people on the call today whose actual first indication that they had pancreatic cancer was jaundice. And that's happened because where the cancer is in the pancreas, it's blocking the flow of bile, which is the jaundice, out of the liver. And sometimes that's treated by placing a stent, which is a tube holding that duct back open to allow the jaundice to, to, to allow the bile to pass normally into the bowel. Sometimes over time, that stent can become blocked again, in which case we often talk, we go back to the surgeons about actually, can that be person have a further stent put in to open it up again? Now, also in the context of pancreatic cancer, sometimes over time, pancreatic cancer can spread to the liver. And sometimes jaundice can reflect actually nothing to do with the bile per se, in terms of the outflow. It can reflect actually the liver isn't working as well as it was normally. So it's not an easy answer to say, yes, it is or no, it isn't. It actually depends on the circumstances. So if you're not sure, if you, if you do know somebody with that, that you're talking about, you can ask the question, actually, why is the person jaundiced? And hopefully I've given you a bit of an idea of what answer you should be looking for. Yeah. I think that's it, isn't it, Margaret? It's key, you know, the timing of it. And if it's a new symptom um, and just yes. with the health professionals. Yes. Okay, so uh, next question. Um, does this mean that palliative can help with getting equipment for the house? Yeah, I, th I think I think it's um, it's something that that is with is within within our remit. I think it depends on depends on the situation. If it's purely equipment, then occupational therapy would be who we would be calling upon. But usually, it's in the context if somebody's now needing equipment, then there's a general change in their health. So it's not usually as simple as just 
actually, yeah, we just need now need a rail or now needs um, sort of a commode or something like that. Uh, it's that usually is is in the in the context of of a of a changing health, which is so it's back to the holistic care, not seeing things as just one thing. Um, so yes, we 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 do uh, as part of our routine care order um, order equipment in, and our occupational therapist is as much more knowledge than I do about what what to order in for for what uh, what condition. But if you're under the palliative care team and, and you feel that that actually you need something, I would just flag that up to them, and and usually it's a relatively straightforward um, straightforward fix, or or they'll know someone who can help. Just to add into that as well, um, district nurses are often um, a really good source of support for getting in equipment. So, and they can normally get it in quite quickly. So, things like hospital beds or commodes. So, if you are under a community nursing team as well, um, then they're probably the best people to ask if you're not under palliative care. Okay, so uh, next question. Uh, my dad has been given approximately three to six months. With regards to eating, drinking, sleeping, it's sometimes difficult to know whether to follow the medical advice or to follow my dad's wishes, which can be different. He does have other medical conditions alongside the cancer. That's a difficult one, isn't it? I think it's, yeah. you know, I don't want to don't want to go against what medical professionals and, and obviously there's there's very there's specifics there, aren't there, that, that, that we 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 can't go into now but i i i think it's i think a lot of what we do in part of care is balancing up and often probably it feels like you you ask part of care an answer and it's usually gray the problem is is that often it is it's very individual i i would say that if if your father's prognosis is sadly short i think what we're focusing on is quality of life isn't it so it's trying to to balance up what is what is going to give him the best quality of life and sometimes things, things like nutrition and hydration actually somebody becomes dehydrated that can make their symptoms worse so actually having enough to be able to still try and do the things as much as you can uh, and to avoid other symptoms is, is important but equally not to the point of causing other problems or actually that becoming the focus of someone's life is actually trying to get enough enough nutrition and hydration in so it's a slightly woolly answer i'm afraid but it, it, it's trying to balance balance that up what i would probably suggest is actually if if what you're being told by medical professionals seems to be different to what your father's saying is actually to try and get them to sit down and, and to to negotiate actually what what is the best thing for your dad as an individual um to to try and uh, and maximize that quality of life Thanks, James. It's a difficult one to answer, isn't it? But I think you did a great job. Okay, so my brother was diagnosed in January with stage four pancreatic cancer. He's having chemo every two weeks. I want to know how to help and what are end of life signs that will let me know the time has come for me to step in and help. Again, I think it's very much depends on you and your brother um, and asking him what you can do to help and support him through that journey of chemotherapy is probably the place to start, isn't it? Whether that's the practical business of actually, if he says to you, yes, I really appreciate you driving me there or taking me there, or can you sit with me there if you're allowed into the unit? It might be something as straightforward at that at this point. In terms of recognising end of life, it would be more what I talked about in that last section of the talk in terms of actually that um, change in his physical independence, it might coincide with him hearing news from the oncologist that the treatment isn't working as well as we'd hoped it would. Um, so again, in terms of what he needs from you, I would suggest asking him, you know, would he want you to go with him perhaps to the oncology appointments in terms of providing support? Totally depends on your relationship. It might be practical things at home that you know more about than I in terms of bringing in shopping or particular things that you know he likes as treats in terms of appetite. Because very often when a person's having chemotherapy, their appetite and what they will eat and won't eat changes. Um, but I'm sure as a sister, you know, you know what he's going to like. 
So there's that side of practical stuff now. And as we said, if we think about the graph, think about all the triggers we talked about earlier for recognizing end of life, then it will be a different focus and a different role at that point when we're on the, on the tail of that slope. And I think just from an emotional point of view, I think it, it almost depends day by day, doesn't it? What, you know, what, what people, and it's, it's just a cliche, but it, you know, it's a roller coaster, isn't it? So actually what people are going to need from a, from a physical and, and practical point of view tends to be slightly more consistent, but from an emotional point of view, it may be that one day, you know, somebody wants to talk about how they're feeling and, and, and be very open about that. It may be another day, actually, what they want is distracting and they just, you know, they just want to pretend for a day that it is, that this isn't happening and that's okay. Uh, but to echo what Margaret said, I think depending on the rela what relationship you have, I think it, to probably ask asking what what can I do because I think one of the things we see is that um, I think carers and family members probably underestimate the importance of or not the importance the the um, the benefit that they have in just being just being there and, and sometimes you can feel helpless by wanting to do things but actually just being there is and just being a support being on the end of a phone end of a text is is can, can mean the world to people definitely thanks both okay so question from ian hi ian um the concept of a palliative care team seems a wonderful way of taking a holistic approach to cancer care however i'm not aware of there being a specific palliative care team in our area central scotland or might this be the macmillan nurses yes mm. yes so this is the bit where palliative care teams as we say in some areas are are run by charities um, and for example, in Cardiff, we don't have Macmillan nurses in the community, but from City Hospice, we fulfil the same role. So I don't know about Central Scotland, but as I say, that little that website that we included earlier should enable you to find who your local services, or I don't know if they could um, contact yourselves later, Nicola, to, to be directed. Yeah, of course, we'll Thank certainly you. go through that. Okay, so are second opinions worth pursuing at the palliative stage? I think it. I think it depends. It uh, it depends kind of on what what you're what you're asking. But I think that if if there are unanswered questions, I, I'm taking that that it means about active treatment is what I'm thinking. Often we see patients who who maybe have unfortunately progressed through lines of chemotherapy and and are being told that actually unfortunately there isn't any more treatment and that they ask for a for a, a second opinion and I think that's a completely valid thing to do you know the, the, that it, it's as an onco if I was an oncologist that wouldn't offend me you know that actually I would rather somebody almost be able to explore that and and it may be that either you know if there isn't anything at least somebody has had that had the opportunity to almost put that put their mind at ease that no we've explored everything so I think it, it's if we're talking about active anti-cancer treatment like chemotherapies if you're unsure as, as a patient actually and you want a second opinion and that's completely completely valid and done very commonly actually isn't it you're not going to offend anybody by asking not at all Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, my husband has been diagnosed with PC, which has metastasized to liver four weeks, has had liver biopsy and verbally confirmed, but have not yet had an appointment to discuss prognosis or treatment. Can we, can we request palliative care now or do we have to wait for discussion and do we request through our GP? Yes, we often see people who are exactly in the situation that you're describing. Um, because for us, as we say, there's a role in symptom control and the whole holistic care process that we can start. So it would seem reasonable to me to ask for palliative care referral and request it through your GP. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. Um, my husband has been diagnosed with advanced PC and his condition is getting worse, but he's refusing to talk about the future. What can I do? I think we might have covered that slightly um, during the session. I think it's difficult, but it's, it's not it's not uncommon at all. Um, I think obviously it's going to be individual to, to you as a couple, but I think that I'm, I'm surmising that given that you're here today, that you're, you want more information and, and to think about the future. Um, 
in those situations as a team, what we usually do is try and is is, is trying to impress or, or try and explain the reasons why thinking about the future can help and, and to to the, the patient. But that if somebody really doesn't want to engage, then usually what we, we strongly recommend that they allow us almost a proxy who, who is going to make that decision, whether that be legally through something like a power of attorney or actually is it it's just who who's going to be that decision maker it's mm -hmm. a pressure for that person who who is going to accept that but sometimes that can be the that can be a, a way of working and especially if if somebody needs more than information needs how they need more information than the patient if the patient and, and it's got to stress that the, that if somebody's got capacity then everything needs to be done with the consent of that of that patient but actually, if if they can have separate conversations and separate planning with 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 teams, that 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 can work quite well and be and, and almost meet everybody's needs. Then, mm -hmm. great, thanks, James. So this is a symptom question. Uh, you mentioned that noisy breathing is saliva and doesn't mean they are in pain. Is this always the case, or can it be a sign of distress? So. Um... The noisy, rattly breathing is usually a symptom that if it if you notice it and it's occurring, you're looking at somebody being the last hours of their life. Um, it can occur at the same time as a person being in some kind of agitation or distress, but not necessarily. So sometimes it is just exactly as I described earlier. It is just that saliva. And by repositioning the person in bed, actually it take, it fades away because you've swallowed and the saliva's gone. Or as I say, we do use medication to try and dry saliva up so that it's not so noticeable. Um, it doesn't mean that the person's in pain. It doesn't mean that the person's agitated. So those are separate symptoms that also need managing if they're spotted in the, in the patient, in the person at this point. I think it's probably just worth um, worth saying as well, just that that's in the context of somebody who's deteriorated significantly. So if somebody's otherwise happened around and you, you're hearing problems with their breathing, then they need they need someone to have a listen to their chest, see what see what's going on. Um, but at the end of life, um, you know, we've usually seen those changes that Margaret spoke about earlier on as well. Um, and uh, and yes, it's uh, it's very individual, but um, but usually there are things we can do to help. Thanks both. Okay, so another symptom question. My mum is starting to struggle with swallowing. Is she likely to be moved to a syringe driver or the injectable medication? Is a port an option rather than a syringe driver? And I'm assuming that that's a port or cath. I think that often with progressive pancreatic cancer, you can get a sense of a lot of fullness and that, that small meals feel like what would have been a three course meal before and you know people can get things like reflux so if we can manage them with oral medications with anti-sickness and things to help move things through then usually that's what we would try and do in the first instance but if that isn't reliable either because they're vomiting or, or feeling nauseated or actually we think that maybe this medicine isn't going in isn't getting where we need it to get to then what we would usually use is a syringe driver a syringe driver is um uh, in the community and actually even in hospital it would be through a syringe driver because it's less invasive uh, than using things like a port and there's also the familiarity with it so it literally just goes under the skin it's not a cannula um, which you know some people have nightmares over if they've had lots and lots of cannulas which are, which are very difficult to put in just goes under the skin and, and, and usually provides very good symptom relief so I wouldn't see it as a negative. Actually, it may well be that that really improves mum's uh, mum's sort of symptom control. So if we're starting to struggle with that, what I would suggest is probably speaking to if you're under palliative care team or um, or the GP or, or an oncology is to speak to the person you're having the most contact with about that and for them to review it. And it may be that if mum isn't under palliative care, that actually now's the time to engage because they could look at those at those symptoms. Right, thanks James. Um, next question, would the palliative care team help with establishing eating again following the fitting of a duodenal stent? 
So if the duodenal stent's been fitted, I'm assuming the person was an inpatient for that. Um, and I'd like to hope that the dietitian was involved um, and should give you advice, sometimes sheets, about what kind of food fluid is acceptable to use that will find easy to go through again, um, preferably before you were, were discharged. But if you're in the community, again, there, are, there should be dietitian cover wherever you are. Um, if you're known to the palliative care team, you could perhaps access it through them or through your GP because... I would see that as a priority, I would think, yeah. so that you're given the right information about what food and fluid is acceptable. Now, my memory on the Pancreatic UK website was there were some good information sheets about both the duodenal stents and what to use. So I don't know, Nick, could you expand there? Yeah, we've got lots of information um, and you can also contact us on the support line and we can talk quite specifically about diet after a duodenal stent. So some tips on do's and don'ts. Um, the aim really is to stop that stent from being blocked. Um, so there are certain things that you would want to avoid. But yeah, just have a look on our website or I would encourage you to contact us on the support line and we can go into that in more, more detail, certainly. Um, OK, so I would running out of time i'm conscious we've only got a couple of minutes uh, we can probably just squeeze in one last question um tanya has mentioned about she's recently been diagnosed with a large um, pancreatic tail excuse me tumor um, and she's been suffering from chronic diarrhea and weight dropping fast um actually tanya we could probably answer that on the support line if that's okay we can talk about that quite specifically because you might find that some of that is related to some digestive issues with the pancreas um is that okay james and magrid if we yeah yes, yes, that's yeah, that. that sounds, that's sounds what we perfect, would suggest yeah. yeah so we would encourage you to to contact us or we'll send you an email um with some more information so I'll just squeeze in this last question because I think it's quite um, a relevant one. Um, how significant is seeing fluid building up in the abdomen around the liver? Cancer is spread to the liver and draining is taking place. I think being honest, I think that that, that is suggestive that, that things have, um, have progressed. That, that buildup of fluid is um, usually either directly because of the cancer itself making making the um, sort of the veins uh, more leaky, or the liver maybe not working quite as it should. Um, so it's important to to manage those symptoms. So things like that drainage to get rid of not all the fluid, but enough to help with symptoms of of discomfort or. Uh, early fullness when eating those sorts of things is important mm -hmm. i think that itself would suggest that that's a change from where we were previously so back to what we were speaking about before is that if that person feels in a position to actually start thinking about the future it might be it might be that that starting to think about that now while we're continuing with the symptom control continuing with the drainage that that to me would probably be a, a sensible thing if that if that feels right to them okay thank you both so much there was lots of questions there um but you answered them brilliantly so we really appreciate that in the session today um thank you everyone for joining and asking all those questions um, as I've said before, if we didn't manage to get to your question or if you have more questions following the session or if you would like to just talk things through, please do give us a ring on 0808 801 0707 or you can email us at nurse at pancreaticcancer.org.uk. We hope you found the webinar useful this evening. When you leave, you'll be taken to an anonymous feedback survey and we'd be really grateful if you would fill this out. However, if the survey doesn't show, then don't worry as we will be sharing the link by email tomorrow as well. Um, it should only take a few minutes and your thoughts are really helpful for us when it comes to planning our future events. So um, it's just left for me to say thanks once again and please do have a look at any of our future events on our website that you might be interested in. And thanks, James and Margaret. No, thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.